Okay. Last lecture. Ooh. That excited? <laughs> okay. Uh, I have like four of you that were, would need to show me their lab notebook. So please don't forget, I have this with me. Give you a final grade on that. And yeah, the last chapter. Uh, this is chapter 33 in your textbook. Um, analysis of food contaminants, residues, and chemical uh, constituents of concern. Can you so, guess what your least favorite subject was? What's that? What are we supposed to guess what your least favorite subject was? Did you say on the first day? Least favorite? Oh, yeah. Can you guess? Uh, it's past. IR is the one you did. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Was it that obvious? Yes. Yeah, it was so sad. <laughs> so bad for you. I don't like it. Anyway, good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this one either, but I wrote the chapter. <laughs> it just took a lot of work. I didn't like it. Anyway. Okay. So. At any point during production, whether on the land, to in transport, processing, to retailer, to consumers, we have chances of contamination. Uh, or contamination by something that was uh, contaminating the food or occurred or present during processing, developed during processing, for example, acrylamide or QNs can develop during processing. So on the land, whether it's animals or crops, what do you think might wind up in the food that we don't want? Yes? Pesticides. There is a um, cert for every pesticide. You see there we have over 1300 registered pesticides that can be used. So any pesticide that is developed or produced that has to have a registration number. It has to be registered and defect, not defect action number. In this case, it's tolerance level has to be identified. That means what's the maximum amount that can be present in food and considered tolerable. So pesticides, uh, what other than pesticides that we don't want? in our milk or in our meat, in that case, <laughs> kitchen. Feces? Huh? Animal feces? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aiming at that one, huh? Antibiotics. Antibiotics, yes. So antibiotics usually are administered um, as pre-therapeutic, that means we, they give them at low doses so that prevent infection. Or if the animal is infected, then they give them the antibiotics. Uh, but before slaughter or before lactation, there's a number of days that they have to stop the antibiotic before um, lactation or, or slaughter of the animal so that it doesn't end up in the meat or the milk. Okay. Sorry. So, like, um, on food packaging, when they claim like free of antibiotics, wouldn't they all be free of antibiotics? Yes, they're confirming to you that's free. Yeah, right. okay. <laughs> they are putting the stamp that it's free of antibiotics. You shouldn't have any antibiotics in milk. And it's again, if you're doing the project that I no longer do, which I feel sad because you would learn a lot, but it's a lot of work. Um, if you have milk as your raw ingredient one of the quality tests is antibiotic testing before it's used for cheese or whatever you want to use it for. So yeah, the tolerance level is zero for antibiotics. Yeah, so, um, so pesticides, sometimes um, adulteration happens, like melamine, we're going to talk about that. Adding melamine is an adulteration. Sometimes you have, you process, you add sulfites, and some people have, are intolerant to sulfide. So there's a certain level above which you have to put on the label that it contains sulfide. So 
basically at any stage you can get either contamination or production of toxin of nitroso and for example the use of nitrates and curing of meat so sometimes it is added for adulteration sometimes it is uh, a pesticide or a heavy metal for example is considered a chemical that you don't want in your food like mercury or silver uh, this is a little older, I was taken from an older edition of the book, but this is just to forget about the year. This changes, obviously, the reporting of hazardous material of food. But then what I want to show you here is that it gets categorized. The chemical contamination or uh, chemical residue could be an antibiotic, could be a pesticide, could be sulfide, could be a heavy metal. Um, could be chemicals produced during processing like churan, acrylamide. So that's the chemical category. And it's usually it's the bulk of the uh, reported hazard come from chemical uh, contamination. Mycotoxin is another one uh, that could uh, also be a big one, I agree. Um, mostly from fungal production of toxins. And then microbiological, which is not something we covered in this class. And the other, the categories like adulteration, for example, is under other, others, like melamine is under other. Um, also uh, packaging material. So like bisphenol A comes from the plastic used uh, for the bottles of water or um, ink chemical that can migrate from the ink on the package to your food. So that is the category of others. So for, so we categorize those contaminants into three big ones, uh, pesticides, mycotoxins, and antibiotics. All of them have government tolerance level. So like um, FDA, tolerance level. Allergens is another category that we will talk about. They're not contaminants, but they are residues of concerns for allergic individuals. Um, and then the chemical additives. So either added as an adulterant like many, or added for processing like nitrite and nitrates, or sulfide is usually added as a preservative or added um, to prevent browning because it's an antioxidant. So sometimes it is added for, especially in dehydrated fruits, for example, it's added. Sometimes it's added in wine making uh, to preserve color and flavor uh, over storage of wine. This is a good study table. It kind of gives you um, like the different contaminants or residues of concern, the main ones, pesticides, mycotoxins, antibiotics, GMOs is another. Uh, it's not a contaminant, it's not a chemical. It's just some people don't want to consume genetically modified organisms. So we need to identify uh, the presence of GMOs, allergens for labeling, sulfides as well as nitrites. And the list is beyond that, but these are the main ones that we'll see in your know, chapter in, uh, of the book. And this table here summarizes uh, how do we analyze them via quantitative methods and screening methods. So pesticide, mostly GC, because most of the pesticides are volatile and nonpolar. So they are mostly um, quantified like GC. There is HPLC as well used because some of the newer pesticides are more polar and not volatile. So with the newer pesticides that are being registered, we are using HPLC methods. Um, there is the multi-residue methods and the single residue methods. So, the difference between multi-residue and a single residue is basically what the word states, that the method of extraction 
of these analytes and analysis targets multiple pesticides. So in one run, we can monitor presence of five or six different pesticides. The single residue methods are methods of extraction or isolation of a single pesticide. So the method has been optimized to isolate one particular pesticide and to detect and quantify that. This usually in a pesticide theory, uh, single residue method is used when you want to register uh, with the government the pesticides and also identify or determine the tolerance level. So when you want to register the pesticide, determine its characteristic and tolerance level, we usually utilize more labor intense method to kind of not only isolate the pesticide, but select one particular uh, component. And every pesticide of different chemical structure and using the identity of that chemical structure, we develop extraction methods that are specific for that component. Um, mycotoxins, also HPLC and DC, mostly HPLC. Uh, we can also use capillary electrophoresis, which I believe I did not cover that one slide in the proteins uh, lecture. Uh, immunoassays um, are used where mycotoxins and antibiotics immunoassays are the competitive ELISA. So you want to remember these are small compounds, so we need competitive ELISA. Presence of GMO, either PCR, mostly used to detect DNA of the genetically modified organism, or the protein using ELISA. Allergens, the same, PCR, DNA for specific proteins, and ELISA, as well as the protein program. Sometimes the most common method I would start this. Monian Williams method, which is the name of the folks that came up with this method, said DOAC method is mostly used straightforward method. There are also high chromatography enzymes, nitride, the colorimetric method, and because there are salts, inorganic salts, we can use high chromatography as well. So that column here is the um, semi-quantitative qualitative screen in biochemistry, with coupled with enzyme inhibition, immunoassays, <laughs> mycotoxin, also TLC immunoassays, and antibiotics. A uh, series of them. We're going to go over a couple. Better flow uh, strip. It's a sandwich ELISA based quick assay, and then the liquid method is a quick. Uh, analysis uh, method as well with all the nitrites, a quick method with the ion selective electrode, the factor bar salt, um, minerals analysis chapter. Also, there are specific test strips for that. Is this people So it's not like memorization, but you want to know at least one quantitative method and one semi quantitative. Yeah. Because it might be a question on the final that asks you about the method of detection of pesticides. And then we've gone all over DC and PLC in previous lectures, so we will be able to explore. So general consideration, so usually contaminants or uh, residues of concern, they are not um, distributed equally or normally normalized in our sample. So the sample needs to be really very well homogenized and selective um, and representative sample uh, is collected. Uh, so how can we achieve that? We want to make sure that we select a representative sample from the lot and homogenize it really well before we take out replications. 
So collection of sample, also storage of the sample, we have to make sure that we store it under conditions that we don't elicit changes or degradation in the components we're looking to measure. Uh, so sample preparation is sometimes expensive because if it is a nonpolar sample, you want to extract, but a lot of with solvent, a lot of other nonpolar sample constituents will be extracted. So we need to fractionate and clean up sometimes using um, chromatography column or um, solid phase micro extraction. I don't know if you remember from GC, Gary talked about solid phase extraction and solid phase micro extraction. In solid phase extraction, you use a column with um, filled with any type of stationary material that would target the component of interest. So we really need to know the properties of the MLS in order to select for the type of fraction agent. And solid phase micro extraction. So you have some sort of a needle that is coated with a specific material that would react strongly with your enema. And then we take that and then we do the next phase uh, analysis with pieces. So if you remember what Gary talked about, solid phase extraction, solid phase micro extraction. And then we concentrate because these. Uh, analytes are usually very small concentration, so con concentrating the sample is important. And sometimes, especially if we're doing GC analysis, we might need to verify to make the analyte volatile and thermally stable. Then we use chromatography most of the time for separation, detection, and identification. And we collect the data to quantify and measure. So these, the sample preparation and the collection of sample really depends on the food nutrients we use. And we have how moisture, how fat, how carbohydrates, it really determines what extracting solvents we're going to use. What do we know about the analyte? It helps with cleanup and concentration, and whether or not it's feasible for our labs to have the tools to do the analysis. And whether or not we're doing multi residue with several pesticides versus a single residue, which is more intense, more time consuming, because we are trying to isolate a single residue from a whole complex cell. So, this is basically what I just talked about about preparing. Your sample, homogenization, extraction, and cleanup. So we talked about solid phase extraction. Um, and there is a specific solid phase extraction with a figure in your textbook. You might see this abbreviation. So usually it's quick, easy, cheap, efficient, rough, and safe. You don't have to know that. Um, but that is explained in the textbook as FYI. If you ever want to go through the textbook at work, you might need to do that. So you can look at the figure there. Um, also, using accelerated solvent extraction and elevated temperature and pressure to enhance the extraction. We talked about that in the fat analysis chart. And analysis, chromatography, a lot of GCHPLC, qualitative in their chromatography, and then identification, a lot of it happens with MS identification, and quite a bit of immunoassays are developed for these residues. So we'll start with pesticides. Like I said, there are a lot of pesticides that can be used. I don't even know if this number is still the same or increased. This number is from the last edition of the book from 2017. So probably the number of pesticides increased uh, from that time. But anyway, they have to be registered to be legally used. We need to identify their um, tolerance level and they have to be registered uh, for, for, for legal use. 
Um, and some of the methods are for multi residue, where we can measure several, or single residue, where you know what you're looking for and you use a amino assay, or you extract until you get one singular uh, analyte of interest, and then you do GC and then you do SVD. Um, a lot of the former pesticides, like I said, were more non-polar, but the more recent are polar pesticides, soluble in water. There are some quantitative methods uh, using similar chromatography coupled with enzyme inhibition and So this is just to show you, illustrate that this is done by GC analysis. Um, you have different columns you can choose from based on the analyze, and also different detectors based on the different elements you have in your um, pesticide. Um, and you can use control So this is just, um, you don't need to memorize, but just to know that GC is used and you have different columns and different detectors that you can use for that. For HPLC, it's used mostly for uh, polar, non volatile, non polar, stable. You can also have a different choice of stationary phases based on the analyte. And also an array of detectors, UV fluorescence, but a lot of it has MS in it uh, for confirmation. So a lot of the methods use actually LCMS. It's the detector will be mass spectrometry detector. And with mass spectrometry detector, you don't, if you don't have good separation, that's not a problem because you can get um, the spectra that will give you better identification. So you basically get your ions, and you, based on the ions you get, you can piece it out and determine the, the compound using a library. Sometimes you have to do MS MS. So you remember from the MS lab, we said that the also MS gives you some identification, but if you want um, confirmation, it's better related to an MS in Canada. So here is this here showing the single MS, this is showing uh, MS MS. For the single MS, sometimes you have really crowded spectra. Trying to compare it to your standard, you might not be able to get good information. But if you take certain ions and fragment them some more, then you get cleaner spectra that could potentially give you better uh, hits using your library for matching the type of companies that you have. You can use immunoassays. And again, under score competitive alignment. If I, in the final, I ask you for an example of an application for competitive ELISA, do not say protein. It's not used for protein. It's used for small compounds that have a singular epitope. You cannot use, uh, you cannot do sandwich ELISA with small molecule because it doesn't have two epitopes to attach to antibody. So you want to remember that. Um, so you can use competitive type of ELISA where uh, higher absorbance means higher concentration or lower concentration? Lower. Lower, it's the opposite. Because the label, this is label, this is your analyte in the sample. These two are competing. If you have low concentration of the analyte, then your label one will bind and then you will have a color. So the more the analyte binds or labeled analyte bind, that means you don't have that much on the sample. If more of your analyte is present in the sample, you have less of the label one binding, so you have less color gene. The thin layer chromatography, the way it's done for your pesticide, so you, you run your samples on the um, on your plate that is covered with your silica, so you run, and then the way you generate it or um, develop it, I would say, you spray with a substrate. 
Why? Because the pesticide usually target enzymes um, that help the pest, the pest grow. So for example, the cholinesterase is, a, is an enzyme in insects. If the pesticide is present, it will inhibit this enzyme and the pest will, will die. So what happens is you, you spray it with the substrate for this enzyme, and then you spray after that with the enzyme, and you incubate. And if a color is developed, that means you don't have an, a pesticide. When you see clearance, that means you have the pesticide that produced the uh, inhibitor for the enzyme, so you don't see a color change. So mycotoxins is the uh, other major component in, in this category. So they are formed by fungus. Uh, basically, they're metabolites of fungus, mostly Aspergillus flavus is a very common one. So the, if there is fungal fungus that is growing, depending on the stage of growth, it might produce the, uh, the toxins, and the toxins will then be in the food. Um, aflatoxins are major ones. They are potent carcinogens, and some are immunosuppressive. Um, Ocratoxin A is a nephrotoxin, that means it, it attacks the nerves. Now, that you have tolerance level, but some aflatoxins, uh, their tolerance level is zero, like aflatoxin B1, it's not here. But aflatoxin B1, for example, it's a, a genotoxin. So it's a very potent carcinogen and tolerance level is zero. So lots of methods of analysis. Again, here in the center, you have the um, ELISA, competitive ELISA, immune affinity, where you have antibodies and disease, and then you calculate and quantitate. Um, Reverse phase HPLC can be used and PLC. Drug residues, so antibiotics basically. Like I said, they're given if you have an infection, if the animal has an infection, so it's the either given at to a peptic level to heal the animal, or the animals are put on. Uh, Subtherapeutic levels. So they are constantly given antibiotics to enhance growth and reduce incidences of infection, but they have to be discontinued in a certain amount of time prior to slaughter or lactation. So there are whole, lots of classes of antibiotics, um, different types, different uh, families of antibiotics that can be used. Um, but we don't want them in the food for many reasons. One, some people are allergic to antibiotics. Um, some uh, potentially, um, if you have them a lot, then you would end up having bacteria resistance. So we don't want that either. And if we have them in our product, like milk, and we're trying to produce yogurt or anything that requires fermentation, they will inhibit the growth of the microbes, fermenting microbes, so we don't want that as well. So for all these reasons, we don't want them in our milk or meat. So methods of analysis, uh, turbidity measurement. So usually you, you want to inoculate with bacteria, and then you would have the growing media. And then if you have antibiotic from your sample, you won't see a lot of growth. So you would measure turbidity over time. And if you don't, the turbidity does not increase, that means you don't have enough growth. Uh, the diffusion process is very common. So you have your media plate, and then you inoculate it with uh, your bacteria or whatever. Usually, say, 21 is bacillus seropharmophilus. And then you have discs here. In each of these discs, you put your sample. So an extract of your sample or your sample, let's say the milk. And then if you have antibiotic in there, they're going to diffuse out of the disc and will inhibit growth around. So this is the quality of the milk to determine whether or not 
you have antibiotics in your stomach. Another one very common is transfers. Here you have one of your reagents is a radio labor antibiotic or drug, similar to what you're testing for. And then you have your milk sample and you inoculate with bacteria and then you measure the radioactivity. So, so the radioactive or radio drug will compete with the antibiotic residue that you have in your sample. If you have a lot of antibiotic residue, they will bind on the bacteria surface, and then you will have less reading of radioactive. If you have no antibiotics, you'll have the highest maximum readings of the radio drug that attached to the surface of the bacteria. So this is how it works. Um, you, we can use HPLC um, with a detection, UV detection, reverse phase, or we can do GCMS as another uh, quantitative method of detection. So allergens, um, they trigger an allergic response and we have to report them or put them on the label. This is by the Food Allergen Label Consumer Protection Act. If you have any ingredient that is a potential uh, allergen, it has to be, you have to put the disclaimer, or if the product is processed, like um, M&Ms, you have the chocolate M&Ms and you have the peanut M&Ms, but on the chocolate M&Ms, you have to put that's processed, there might be peanut contamination. So you have to have that. Um, now it, it's big nine, not big eight. So you know it says big eight, but it is big nine. You can have a soup of test. Maybe this year. Okay. Yeah, I just I didn't realize big nine. It's there. It's there. And maybe next year we'll add P to the list. The year after, I don't know what, but the more exposure. We have the more the list is going to go. Um, so, to determine presence of allergen, of course, ELISA is the biggest one. Uh, to, it's an immunoassay. We can do qualitative determination in Western blood. Also, semi quantitative with biosensors. So, sensors coated with having antibodies and uh, the uh, the substrate, the labeled antibodies and the substrate for the enzyme. So you basically um, have determine whether or not they're present. So, but there are, there's always issues with um, protein methods is how well we're extracting the protein for the acid. So this is showing me two Western bloods for pea protein, uh, not uh, peanut protein extraction. So we see here very prominent anti, uh, very prominent immune reactive proteins that don't show up. So the difference between A and B is that the extraction method of the protein. So with A, we use the buffer and salt. With B, we use only extracting the protein with buffer without salt. So some of the allergenic proteins were not extracted. So with the protein essence, we have to be very careful in terms of how we are extracting the protein for analysis in order not to get a false negative um, reaction. So PCR determining the DNA of the different proteins um, or sequences that result in the production of these proteins. So doing the PCR uh, protein reaction method. And here, it is great, it targets the DNA, whether or not it's present, but sometimes during processing, we extract, we isolate, we, we heat, we might destruct the DNA or extract them completely, so we won't be able to detect their presence. So kind of like maybe do both to complement each other. Now I'm going to go quickly through the other list of contaminants, um, talk about sulfites, nitrites, the adulterant, marine packaging material, product, uh, products of processing, furan and acrylamide, uh, naturally present or potentially produced due because of the presence of different ingredients together, 
uh, monochloropropane for use during processing and percolate contamination uh, from the soil. So some of these substances can be banned. Some of these substances are present naturally, uh, but they have legal limits. Some are adulterants. Some are approved for use, but of concern, monosodium glutamate, high concentration might be a concern. Um, and then natural, that means during processing, they can be formed due to the natural constituents of the food products. So very quickly, I'm going to walk you through some of those. Um, there are so many different methods of analysis, but many of the methods are really heavy and difficult. Chromatography with, with mass, mass spectrometry, so we can have low limit of detection. So, so because there might be present at very low concentration, so we really need sensitive methods. They're laborious, expensive, time consuming. So a lot of effort is being put forth to develop quick methods that are sensitive um, for them. Sulfites, so these, there are different types of sulfur-containing uh, compounds, the sulfur dioxide, sulfur acid, various in organic form. So they can either be present naturally or added as a preservative and as an antioxidant to prevent browning. Some people are sensitive to it, and if we have higher than 10 ppm, we need to put it on the liquid. There, uh, most methods of analysis determine the free form of sulfide and some bound form. There's not one method that can detect all of the form. However, we have the official method of analysis. This is AOAC method. It detects most of the forms, the, you know, the free and some of the bound ones. And uh, it's approved by FDA for labeling purposes. So it is an official method of analysis. So the method is really simple. We uh, heat the test sample with acid, and then we convert all of sulfides to sulfur dioxide. Then the sulfur dioxide is introduced uh, to, um, is oxidized into sulfuric acid. So in the presence of oxygen and peroxide, to generate sulfuric acid, which can be measured quantitative gravimetrically or by measuring fertility. Very easy, straightforward method and um, official. So there are other quick methods, the Ripper method, which is basically a filtration method, enzymatic method, and HPLC coupled with fluorescence. So I'm not spending a lot of time on that. Uh, nitrates and nitrite used for curing of these and preserving. It's mostly a preservative also against the growth of Clostridium botulinum. So sodium nitrate can be converted to sodium nitrite, uh, and we do have some naturally occurring, and some are added during processing. But there's also a limit to how much we can have. Um, there are carcinogens when we produce nitrosal amine. So when you have protein and nitrite, they react together under processing conditions to give you nitrosal amines, which are carcinogens. So AOAC method is a colorimetric method. So a bunch of the agents, I don't expect you to memorize that. The agents are used to generate a color to measure uh, spectrum. Okay. Or you can use um, HPLC, ion exchange chromatography with conductivity detector. <laughs> if we want to use rapid methods for nitrate, the ion selective electrode or test strip that impregnated with some reagents that would give us a color, basically. Don't have to memorize the names of the reagents. Melamine has been um, a few years ago, it's been an issue with imported pet food and uh, milk products or infant formula. 
So the intention of the calculation was not really to harm people, but they wanted to cheat in the amount of protein added because protein is of high value. So they wanted to reduce the amount of protein that they have by adding this melanin. So when we do, look at all these nitrogens. When we do uh, Caldal or Lico, this is gonna be detected as a nitrogen source and we convert it to protein. So it was cheating, but the intention was not really to harm people, but it turned out to be harmful. And to pets, several pets were impacted, resulted in death. And in humans, we got issues with the kidney and in some cases, it's fatal. So it's an organic chemical, not intended for consumption. It's for the formation of formica. So it's, Again, it's considered an, as, a, as an adulterant. And after this happened, um, they started developing methods for detection. Some are LC coupled with tandem MS. Some quicker methods are near IR and near IR. So to, de to determine the presence of melamine because we cannot determine its presence by doing um, Caldal or Dumas. They will show as protein. This one is the bisphenol A, which is um, resultant of the use of polycarbonate plastic, where this product, is, where this chemical can leach into the water uh, or the juice within these bottles. And it causes, um, basically, the, it simulates hormone uh, action in the body. And it impacts mostly young children. Um, span and method of analysis are chromatography and amino assays. Um, this one here comes from ink. If you know, if you notice now, when you open a cereal uh, box, you have a plastic bag inside. It used to be just the cereal in the box, and then the ink from whatever you have on the, the box, the ink goes into the sample. Now to prevent that is you have the inner lining of plastic to prevent um, benzophenol from the ink to migrate into the food. So it mostly impacts the kidney and the liver and long-term health risk to children. Again, LCMS MS is the method of detection or analysis and detection. Curans, these are produced during processing at high temperature. Uh, so if you have you know, high, high carbohydrate and some acidity in your food and you're processing at high temperature, you're forming furans. And these are carcinogens and they are volatile, so they can be measured by headspace TCMS because they're volatile. Acrylamide, again, uh, processing, especially deep fried potatoes might have that because uh, or potato chips, you have carbohydrate rich foods, you have some protein, especially an aspartame amino acid. So the aspartame, the active carbonyl group from carbohydrate, so it's a Maillard reaction secondary product. So you have the carbonyl, the UCN reacting with the aspartame specifically to give you acrylamide. So this is carcinogen, again, chromatography coupled with mass spectrometry. Benzene, it's also carcinogen. It can be present in beverages that contain ascorbic acid and benzoate. You end up having benzene. It is volatile, so headspace sampling, followed by GCMS. Um, this one is reduced monochlorpropane uh, when we are producing a hydrolysate. So vegetable protein, especially soy, when we want to hydrolyze it by acid to produce hydrolyzed vegetable protein, residual fat and the acid can form monochlorpropane. Again, it's a carcinogen, suspected genotoxin, um, and it is volatile, so GCMS is the method. The last one here is perchlorate. So it can be present in the soil. Um, 
it's a component of rocket fuel. Um, and because it can be present in, in the soil, it might wind up in water. Uh, it was found in milk and also lettuce. Some cases reported the, for, the, the presence of perchlorate. Um, it's used with LC, specifically iron, iron exchange for metal refuse and then Okay, so this is the table that would be helpful to study from. It's kind of summarized everything. So uh, instead of you know going through all the slides and trying to study all the slides, this is a table. I'm not sure what the table number in the textbook, but it is present in the textbook. It um, it summarizes all of these components, uh, other than pesticides and mycotoxins and antibiotics and allergens. This is the other components of interest, all of that. So well, how, how can we, how can they be found in food? It's here. Uh, why are they of concern? It's here. What some foods that they can be present in and method of analysis and detection is right. So this is a good study table. Yes. You say the most nutritional parts of this. Yes. The, the compound, the major foods we can identify, and methods. All of it. So <laughs> I might, I might ask you, how does acrylamide form? You want to know? High temperature. Temperature, high high carbohydrate, high temperature. Uh, specifically, reaction with aspirin. Um, yeah, this is, this is summarizing two slides right there. It's good to know. Okay, one last minute. Any burning question? No burning question? Okay, it was a pleasure teaching you. And I hope I'll see you somewhere next semester. Sometime, somewhere. Huh? And in the final. Don't forget your lab notebook if you want me to see it. And specifically, Michael and Tyler. Where is Tyler? Here he is.